I can do whatever I want. I mean, as long as uh, no one catches you doing that, then yeah. Leaning back in my chair? No, whatever you, well, yeah, but that, whatever you want, you know, that kind of thing in general. Mm-hmm. Like, so many things are legal if you don't get caught. In fact, most things are legal if you don't get caught. In fact, everything is legal if you don't get caught. Maybe not legal, but just There's, not de- not uh, not reprimandable. That's true. I'm also I also really love, but also loathe the uh, the the poor people crimes Crime, mm. crimes that are only crimes for poor people. Yeah. For example, speeding. Yes. If you're rich, you can drive as fast as you want all the time, <laughs> and you just pay like. I don't know. On the, on the bad end, a couple hundred dollars. In a I was gonna say I uh, I was actually witnessing some some uh, tickets, some speeding ticket uh, deliberations thing. Yes, uh, full amounts, and it's like, all right, you were caught speeding this amount over. Okay, uh, the a regular charge. You're like the the cost of that is twenty five dollars plus court fees is up to two hundred and fifty dollars. Which, yeah, like you're saying, for somebody who has money. Not water off the back of a duck. Yeah, uh, for, rolls off the back for somebody who uh, does not, who yeah. is who might struggle to pay for groceries every two weeks. Maybe, maybe for example, if you were in in the income bracket in say I don't know the Midwest, like in the thirty five to forty five thousand dollars a year range, that could be extremely detrimental. Anyway. <laughs> This episode of the Dungeon Bros Podcast is sponsored yet again. It is brought to you by the One of One Serialized One Ring, available now in Pokemon Scarlet and Violet Paldia Evolved Boosters. One ring to catch them all, one ring to train them, one ring to beat them all and understand the power that's inside. We didn't pull any One Rings. No. And we're not talking about the One of One Ring. We're just talking about any any One Rings. Any of them. We opened up... It's a legendary artifact. It's a rare... It's not, or is it mythic? I think it's mythic. It's still, okay, uh, fair. It's mythic. But we opened an entire set booster box. We opened, the two of us, eight set boosters and four pre-release kits. And that's just on Monday. On Friday, I opened another four pre-release kits and another eight set boosters. Not a single one ring in any of them. Mm-hmm. It's like one of the few cards that we were like, yeah, we really, I, we expected to get one. Right, our, our friend opened less one i think one uh one pre-release box and maybe a couple of boosters and got two of them yeah one alt art one regular i will say uh the lord of the Rings set is amazing oh it's so much fun it's so good there's so many cool mechanics there's so many amazing cards the art is fantastic flavor wins across the board i will say in the pre-release kits specifically they did not do a very good job of mixing up the cards in the packs yeah i had like four pre-release kits in a row and i was seeing like the same 12 commons all the time yeah (laughs) like we have i think i have multiple like one two maybe two and a half play sets of some of the commons and then there's some commons like i maybe have one copy of like it's a little yeah i was gonna say in in previous openings pack opening sets this is not like i I mean okay they're a little bit more than normal but yeah i've never gotten a full play set of anything in just in just pack openings and i have yeah four or five cards that i have full play sets of not that that's any use to me because i only play singleton formats yeah i mean it's a whole it's a whole thing also also the weird thing where uh we kept opening packs and there'd be like three cards in a row that were somehow related to each other it, it, it was wild i pulled i pulled sam the the stout heart one Frodo Baggins, regular Frodo Baggins, and Gollum Patient Plotter. I, I, I pulled it Frodo, Gollum, Sam mm-hmm. in that order. You pulled... I pulled uh, Legless Counter of Kills, Friendly Rivalry, uh, Gimli Counter of Kills. In that order. Like, there were so many weird, like, duos and, like, trios of cards mm-hmm. that were... I, I, there was an Aragorn, Legolas, Gimli in that order. There were, like, it's... I had three of the Eagles right in a row. Yeah, it was weird. It was, there, there's, some, there's some funky juju going on with those Lord of the Rings packs, and I'm kind of into it. Uh, we also pulled between the two of us four copies of Aragorn the Uniter mm-hmm. in both the extended Pelennor Fields art and regular. Yeah, I have two regular copies and an extended, and you have an extended. I have an extended. Yeah. We each pulled Tom Bombadil. Mm-hmm. We each pulled Radagast the Brown. We <laughs> like it, it. Combined, we have what three different uh, arts of the Nazgul. Yeah, yeah. I'll not the the Nazgul are shockingly expensive right now. People want the Nazgul, man. They're, now. Is the card good? The card is good. Yeah. 
It's not Orcish Bowmaster, which, by the way, I pulled two, two Orcish Bowmasters. Sam didn't pull one. I didn't, yeah. This, this, it's the same art, though, so it's not going. It's not like I need both of these copies to complete the collection of the set, as I'm going to be doing a, a series on TikTok of trying to collect the entire Lord of the Rings Tales Miller set. But they're the, they're the same cop. Like, it's the same version of the card. Yeah. We can, we, once, once I scan all my shit in, which I'm probably going to do either that's what I'm doing this evening or I'll do it tomorrow. Um, we can we can make a trade happen because I definitely want your Nazgul card. Yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to get I'm trying to make a, a wraith tribal with the Lord of the Nazgul and get all the Nazgul arts in there and all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, amazing Lord of the Rings set. Yeah, highly 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 recommend. Highly recommend. Maybe don't get the pre-release kit. We're usually big fans of the pre-release kits. If you play arenas, get one for the code card. Sure, that's kind of it. Uh, it is also nice that they give you two pre-release promo cards mm-hmm. in each instead of one. Uh, I will say the second slot tends to be like the same kind of cards. Like yeah. I got three Wizards Rockets. I got Gandalf, Friend of the Shire, twice. Like it, it's a smaller pool in that second slot, but you still get a whole bunch of really cool promos. Um, YouTube Music is a thing. I it is wanna, a thing. I, YouTube has this new initiative going on right now where you can make a YouTube playlist, a podcast playlist. So we we've, hey, we've been really podcast. Yeah, we do do a podcast. Incidentally, this one. Right now. Right now. Right that here. We're doing. Yeah. Which, by the way, welcome to the Dungeon Bros Podcast. I'm Connor. <laughs> and I'm Sam. We are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. And this, we know what's going on. <laughs> we, we totally told, do this every two yeah. weeks for the past year and a half. God, we're uh, we're almost to episode 50. We're almost, yeah. We need, I, I, 50 is like a weird one to celebrate, I feel. 50. Like it's, a, it's a nice round number. It's right. Halfway to, it's like, we're, we're nearing retirement for the podcast stage at this point. Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, we're, the, the podcasts kind of age like elves, though, so that's they kind true. Of just last for a while. But I kind of feel like we should do something for episode fifty. But at the same time, it's like, eh, you know, it's kind of whatever. What was what was I saying? Uh, YouTube we're music just, podcast. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, YouTube. You can now make playlists on YouTube podcast playlists. So I made the Dungeon Bros podcast playlist that we have on our YouTube channel because this podcast goes live on YouTube, Apple, Apple, Google, Spotify, podcast services around the globe, and. You can now find it on YouTube Music. I'm a big fan of the YouTube Music, actually. I don't use it. You, you, you're your Spotify user. I have Spotify. I've had Spotify Premium for years. Mm-hmm. I was considering getting... I, w- I was looking to get a premium music service. Mm-hmm. And I was looking at Spotify. And then I remembered, wait, there's a bundle with YouTube Premium to remove all the ads off of YouTube and YouTube Music. And the price is about the same as the Spotify Premium. So I ended up going that route. Gotcha. And I'm, I, I can't sing the praises highly enough. I haven't watched an ad on YouTube in a long time. And it feels <laughs> great. The idea of going back to watching ads on YouTube videos disgusts me to my core. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I've had ad block on my computer for the longest time. And yeah, whenever I pull up YouTube on my phone, I remember how sad life is. Yeah, yeah. No, never have to worry about a pre-roll, a mid-roll. I don't have to skip any. Like, it's just... It's just exactly what I need in my life. And, you know, a fair price. But, yeah, if you if you use YouTube Music or to listen, well, you can listen to podcasts on there now and uh, should follow the Dungeon Bros podcast. Leaving reviews on all the podcast services is actually a, the biggest way to support podcasts on these services. Leaving reviews, five stars, all that kind of stuff. Recommend them to your friends. Yeah, we don't, we don't really try to pimp the podcast too much on the podcast. No. But here we are doing that. Do you have anything else you want to talk about with the Lord of the Rings set? We pack, we cracked so many fucking cards. We, if you're watching the live on TikTok right now, we have a giant box of all the the card the, the card wrappers and stuff. It's unhinged. No, uh, I mean I'm sure we'll do once as you get more. We'll, we're going to continue getting cards because you need to uh, you want to fill out that entire binder that you have on the way. Yeah, we have. I have a starter. I have the starter deck bundle on the way because it was only like twelve bucks. Yeah, on Amazon, and you get two full decks, and there's a lot of cards in them that are that are brand new, and I'm obsessive. Yeah, probably gonna get a bundle at some point, probably a gift bundle too. I don't know. We'll have to see. We'll have to see. But so uh, we'll probably be getting more cards. We'll probably tell you. We'll probably do some sort of full Lord of the Rings mm-hmm. set breakdown once post mortem or something. Yes, yes. If if you know, I if if anything happens, I might have to go the way of new TSR files for Chapter Seven bankruptcy because of the set. Ooh, spoilers about what we're talking about later. They've seen the title of the podcast, Sam. Shh, tell no one. What if they can't read? They've seen the thumbnail. Ooh, they might not be watching it on YouTube. Fair enough. I was going to say they see the thumbnail, but 
there's probably text on the thumbnail too. <laughs> well, before we get into that, let's go over the upcoming releases for Dungeons and Dragons and Lord and uh, God dang it and Magic the Gathering. There it is. There oh. it is. Yes, uh, as has been as has been new tradition. The, nothing really changes week to week, but we like to remind everyone: Big B presents Glory of the Giants for Dungeons and Dragons coming out on August fifteenth. On the same day, we will also be getting the practically complete guide to dragons uh the fan devler and below the shattered obelisk campaign book is coming out in september on night on the 19th planescape adventures in the multiverse coming out october 16th and the last fifth edition book well the book of many things i mean yeah the last all... 2014 fifth edition book yeah they're they're i'm i'm just change the edition like just just being like ooh, it's fifth edition D D, but it's all the one D D stuff just you're giving out you're making a new core rule books wizards make just change the yeah change the edition just make it 5.5 everyone everyone understands call it one D for god's sake like just do whatever you want just don't don't do whatever you want do what makes sense do what we want <laughs> yes uh the lord of the rings tales of middle earth is out right now uh if you're listening to it pre-release has just completed uh if you're listening to the podcast the day it posts in two days on friday the 23rd it will be released to all stores but you can go to your local game store right now and purchase packs and decks and the like tell them we sent you it won't help but you no it won't them. it won't at all uh there's also going to be a supplementary set for the lord of the rings coming out on november 3rd later this year uh, we talked about it a little bit on the last podcast. There seems to be what seems really interesting to me are they're they're selling one one of the cool things they're doing is there's collections of cards like four nines. Uh, I think the biggest one is six by three. What's that? Twenty four cards. Eighteen. Eighteen. Something like that. <laughs> that creates that creates like an entire scene in extended arts for all the cards. That creates a cool like the Battle of Pelennor Fields mm-hmm. and, and the Balrog mm-hmm. and that kind of stuff. There is going to be a collection of 3x3 three three scene cards in this November set uh, that they're going to release the scene cards with a frame specifically designed for them and some set boosters with them as well Yeah, as like a little bundle. And I think there's like two or three of those that you can see on Amazon you, and maybe pre-order, but you can't, they don't really have prices or details or anything, sadly. Uh, but they're also uh, going to be releasing the special edition boosters. That's right. Don't know what that entails yet. Hopefully some new card designs. I would love if the November set had uh, battle cards. That'd be cool. That would be really cool. I like, feel like they won't. Battle, like Battle of the Hornburg, Pelennor Fields, uh, uh, Amon Hen, uh, Weathertop. Like they could. They, there's so many cool battles and themes they could do. I would love that. The battle. The battle card type mm-hmm. is very intriguing to me, and I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of that from March of the Machine. On August 4th, we're going to be getting the Commander Master set. Um, gird your pockets loin, your wallet's loins there, and your pockets, because it's going to be expensive. Oh, yeah. Exceptionally expensive. Uh, at pre-release, the prices are already what you would expect for a Master set. <laughs> it's it's ludicrous. Uh, Wilds of Eldraine is coming out for pre-release on September 1st with the September 8th launch. The Doctor Who Universes Beyond Commander decks coming out on October 13th. And the last set of 2023 is going to be the Lost Caverns of Ixalan on a date to be determined in November of 2023. Um, before we move on, we will be going to Gen Con this year in Indianapolis, Indiana. Mm-hmm. It is the biggest collection of board games, tabletop games, um, TCGs, and just so much stuff. Some might say it's the best four days in gaming. Hey, that is that is one of their taglines. That is, one of their t- <laughs> that is indeed a tagline of theirs. Uh, we will be going there all four days. We need to we need to make some friends only posts to see what other TikTok creators and stuff are going because we need to we know some that are going and we're probably going to be staying with them though we haven't we need to hash out those details too we but either, yeah. yeah yeah but if you end up going to Gen Con and you're interested in one of these Lord of the Rings commander decks or better yet the Commander Masters commander decks uh, you will be able to get them in uh, at Gen Con. In those, they have a, a commander pre-con battle events that you can mm-hmm. sign up for. I don't know if those events are sold out yet for all of them, but there's quite a few, and you'll be able to get a commander deck for much more for much less than what their current MSRP is on them. Plus, you also get prize tickets for just participating, which yeah. you can use then to spend on more cards and yeah. other uh, MTG branded stuff. Yeah, we're going. We're going poor. We're going to be poor. We're already poor. We're gonna be. We're gonna be like very poor <laughs> by the end of by by the middle of August. <laughs> That's why we have to budget. 
That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to be better about that. But we have two top stories today. We're talking about uh, new TSR uh, filing bankruptcy after a very brief period of time and the laughable amount of uh, revenue they've had for 2023 so far. Uh, we also there's also a uh, a market report that was done uh, you can find on Market Watch about the tabletop RPG market and it's got some interesting little bits of information and projections that are kind of mind blowing and I don't know how like how they see that amount of growth but mm-hmm. and then we can we're gonna wrap up with a new D and D cookbook a Zelda TTRPG and uh, the new Dimension Twenty Dungeons and Drag Queens in Pride and in Pride Month in Pride Month and in Pride Month so let's dive in. Let's dive in. So, new TSR. For those of you that don't know, TSR is uh, the original company that created Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, One of the co-creators of it was Gary Gygax. Uh, TSR was then... or Dungeons & Dragons was bought from TSR by Wizards of the Coast. What was that, around 3rd edition? Before 3rd edition? I think around there. Yeah, I think it was before 3rd edition. Uh, And then Wizards of the Coast has owned them ever since. TSR kind of uh, fizzled in, into nothing with uh, with when Gary Guy got... Is Gary Guy still alive? No. No. He's dead. Yeah, when he died, it basically was gone. Uh, his son, though, Ernie Gygax, in 2020, in 2020 uh, him, along with Justin Lanassa and Stephen Dinehart, registered defunct TSR trademarks and launched a new venture, uh, calling it New TSR. It has generated... A massive amount of controversy uh, in both the quality of content, but more importantly, the the subjective nature of the content that they've been releasing. It has been uh, of 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 uh, questionable. It has been widely described as hateful. Yeah, hateful, racist, uh, 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 yeah. other not pleasant things. But more concretely. Uh, they attempted to sue Wizards of the Coast via a crowdfunding effort, <laughs> which is just to get to get the rights to some of their stuff back, which is dumb. They were bought. Their, yeah. their stuff was bought. That was a dumb lawsuit. Uh, in March in March of 2022, though, they ended up uh, receiving another lawsuit against them from Wizards of the Coast. We've gone over this in, in past podcasts. Sam has... Sam did a very good job of learning about all that, but in a uh, in a recent filing, we have now found that the new TSR, owned by Justin Lanassa, has filed for Chapter 7 bankruptcy. For those of you that do not know, Chapter 7 bankruptcy, largely considered a, uh, a personal form of bankruptcy to file. In the case of new TSR, it's basically Justin Lanassa's, uh, and he's kind of been, inter- it seems like he's been intertwining a lot of his personal personal debts and personal liabilities and personal expenses in through the new TSR company while also releasing very hateful content that's not really selling in addition to just kind of not releasing things. Uh, But for those of you that don't know, Chapter 7 bankruptcy generally is a form for an individual where it can wipe out many forms of overwhelming debt under the protection of the federal court. Generally, it can erase unsecured debts, that is, debts without collateral. This can include medical bills, credit card debts, and personal loans. But some forms of debt, uh, such as back taxes, court judgments, alimony, and child support and student loans, generally are not eligible for chapter seven bankruptcy it can leave a serious mark on your credit reports as well for a decade or more in the case of new tsr that means they're going to be liquidating all of the company's assets in this filing of bankruptcy we have found out what their total liabilities are this is the amount of debt and expenses uh, average out to about three hundred and eighty four thousand dollars for 2023 which like for a large scale, uh, uh, it's really just kind of two people creator. A, yeah, it's somebody who's looking to create a a, a a a product that they hope to spread. You know, especially a uh, physical product. Mm-hmm. This isn't necessarily un, uncalled for. You know, no, unexpected. That's a re- that's a reasonable amount. You would then expect if this is a good successful product to be making revenue in excess of your liabilities, thus turning a profit. Mm-hmm. Their revenue, again, this is income before any expenses have been removed. Their revenue was $621.93. I want to repeat this again. Their revenue, 
not this isn't in thousands. Nope. This is as as I say, six hundred and twenty one dollars and ninety three cents. Dungeon Bros, the company, the company, the two of us, the two of us, <laughs> between our TikTok creator fund stuff from last year, from live gift donations and subscriptions, which we are immensely great, grateful for. You guys are amazing. Uh, from we also have our homebrew as well on Drive Through RPG, which you know we haven't made a ton of money from. No, most of it's posted for free, and sometimes people throw us a few bucks. Yes. We have not made $621, I don't think. No. We have made about 500 though. And uh, and we haven't spent $384,000. No. No. Outside of our own personal spending on Magic the Gathering cards. Okay, that doesn't count. I don't think we've spent $1,000. No. All really. things told, not really. And which is kind of surprising. I, if you ever, if you ever at our home for whatever reason, that's creepy. Don't stalk us. But if you're ever at our home, our setups are janky as shit. Oh yeah, like they are really janky. Our microphones are being held up by Game Genix deck boxes. Yep. And uh, I think, I think one of them was like given to me. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a whole thing. We have made about the same revenue as new TSR. Mm-hmm. As is expected in the tabletop RPG community, this has been clowned on to no end. Right. We have clowned on new TSR for a lot of their decisions in content. And there was a lot of people that were saying they shouldn't be allowed to make anything. And if you recall on this, I don't know, it was many, many podcasts ago when we were talking about Probably this. Probably about last a year, year ago, yeah. One of our opinions ended up being, if this is as as bad and hateful as people are saying it is, then it will not sell and the marketplace will let it be known. Um, Dungeon Bros were right. <laughs> <laughs> Their revenue, $621.93. Yeah. Now, surely this is after covering like the printing of all of their, of like the product. Usually revenue is inventory yeah. minus sales inventory costs minus sales which so anything that they've physically printed this is at this is after paying for all that i would suspect but man they thought they had it you know yeah. what was what do the kids say they, they thought they ate or whatever they thought they were eating they were there they they had they had this grand plan to return dungeons and dragons and ttrpgs back to the way it was in the 70s uh and of course, in the '70s, it was a much different uh, social, you know, struck political, you know, a social uh, environment. I, d I don't know what they were thinking. Uh, they w they were going to have there. Um, Honestly, I'm not surprised that they're filing for bankruptcy. No, I'm not either. I am surprised by the sheer lack of any money made. Like it, like six hundred and twenty-one dollars for that company. This could have been a multi-million-dollar company. Could have been. It could have been the TSR name. While it's got a lot of baggage, is a very notable name. Oh yeah. Immediate brand recognition. The Gygax name alone could sell books. I mean, that's why Wizards of the Coast was originally su uh, was countersuing them was they didn't want their they didn't want that TSR the Gygax identity associated with wizards of the coast modern yeah um, and, they, and they thought it was going to be negative impact Im negatively impacting them clearly and you may oh this might oh this might trigger some people in the great capitalist society of the united states of america it is proven to not be good and it is proven that the people don't want it and guess what it's going away thank god um R.I.P. in pieces, uh, 2020 to 2023, new TSR. Um, we hardly knew you. Never loved you. Uh, you can go to their website. It's still active, and uh, <laughs> it is devoid of anything meaningful whatsoever. Do you have anything else you want to say about the, the death of the new TSR? No, I think we've uh, buried it. It's six feet under. Actually pretty light we could probably get away with like three feet under you know what if the wolves dig it up and eat it that's fine 
That's fine. That is totally fine. The other major story, Tabletop RPG Market Report. You can find this on Market Watch via the Express Wire. The Tabletop Role Playing Game Market Insights of 2023 is an extensive and comprehensive report that provides a complete analysis of market size, share, revenues, various segments, drivers. Tra- this is for people that study economic markets. Yes. In the United States and abroad, uh, the entire report that they have created is 120 pages. And it gives a forecast of growth trends up to the year 2030. So nearly a decade of coverage here. They started to do it. They started collecting research in 2018, and we have near. We're going to have nearly a decade of both collection of data and forecast projections. Yeah. Yes. Collection and projection. Yes. Very complex, but we we don't have access to the full report because the full report's like four hundred dollars, and you kind of have to like be a business. Yeah. To you, buy you, it. No, and then because you, we're not. We're not. We're not market experts. We would need to also then hire somebody to tell us what all of that 120 pages of yep. content meant. Oh, yeah. All right. So here's here's some highlights that we do understand. The global tabletop role-playing game market reached a total value in U- uh, USD of $1.539 billion. That is $1,539 million. In 2022. That is how they present that information. I think it's silly to reference thousands of millions, but whatever. Their projections expect that the market will achieve over $3 billion by 2028. That is more than doubling in the next five years. This includes, of course, the book creators, accessories, uh, live plays, content, like everything in the tabletop RPG market, mm-hmm. doubling in revenue in five years, post-COVID, post-OGL, post all of this. That is a very, very bold pl- claim. And Sam, I, we love tabletop RPGs. We see we the do. growth. We've seen the growth that 5th edition has had and Critical Role and Stranger Things and all of this. Where are do you think they're getting a double in the total market of tabletop RPGs in five in the next five years? Where where is this forecast coming from? I mean, we have seen that uh, part of the reason uh, Wizards of the Coast has been changing their mantra recently. Uh, we saw that Wizards of the Coast had a, uh, a they had their five year plan accomplished in three years. Um, between, I believe, 2019 and 2022. Uh, we reported on that last year. I can only assume that uh, that sort of idea is is maybe it's maybe uh, expanded across the entire market with uh, all these things, all these things that these uh, reporters were looking at. But yes, um, I mean, obviously, one D&D is going to be massive. People. People love to hate on things, especially popular things, especially when popular things have some major fuck ups. Mm-hmm. And we all acknowledge that Wizards of the Coast have some major fuck ups in the last year. They really this have. year specifically. One D and D is going to be a good tabletop RPG system. The, yeah, and it's going to be a, a jumping off point for people who have wanted to get in for a long time but haven't. Yeah, if you if you like Fifth Edition, it's Fifth Edition, but a little bit refined. Mm. That's really all one D&D is. And you can like it, you can dislike it, but it's going to be massive. We know this. Right. It might not be as massive as it could have been had they not done o- had the OGL debacle and, and the shot over- themselves in the foot last year with all of their different content uh, yep. uh, mishaps and what have you. Over and over and over again. Over and over and over again. But... One thing this controversy has done is brought eyeballs. A lot of people are familiar with the concept of there's no such thing as bad press. All press is good press. All attention is good attention if you're a company. So even though they have all this controversy, for one, the creators that that were upset about the OGL, they kind of won. Yeah. And obviously Wizards of the Coast tried to spin it as everybody won. (laughs) But... 
One D&D and 5th edition are going to be Creative Commons, which is even more of an open license than the OGL ever could have been. Mm -hmm. And once it is Creative Commons, it is impossible legally for it to be revoked. We've talked about this. There's going to be a ton of companies that are going to very easily and very openly be able to create content for One D&D. All of this controversy has also sparked the Orc license, as we've talked about from Paizo. Paizo has been exploding in sales this year because of that controversy, and a whole bunch of other third-party t- tabletop RPGs have been blowing up because of this controversy. Mm-hmm. And there are people that aren't in the tabletop RPG communities that don't know anything about it, that don't play these games, that are now very aware of them. Yeah. Stranger Things brought attention to d d Critical Role, to a lesser extent, did, but when they did the Kickstarter for the animated series, the most funded Kickstarter of all time yeah, in, like, two days, <laughs> which is ludicrous. And with that one, people who didn't, who don't play D&D or who'd mm-hmm. never heard of Critical Role before jumped in when they saw it on Amazon because it was, it was plastered across Amazon's front yeah. page. They have, they have billboards in L.A. for it. Yeah. Not to mention, like... The Kickstarter, that 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 massive success of a Kickstarter, got Critical Role on the Today Show, mm-hmm. on Good Morning America, on all of these mass media outlets that a ton of people watch that have no idea about anything in the tabletop RPG community. And then we can even jump forward a little bit more and go to the D and D movie that released earlier this year. Which, by the way. I don't care what y'all say. That movie is great. That was a, that was a joy to watch. It is. I I very genuinely love that film a lot. It is very very good, and it is despite the fact not it wasn't a very big box off success. It is a critical success. It is uh, a critical success both from film critics and from audiences. D D and D is pretty much synonymous with tabletop RPGs for most people. Yeah. And this last year has been, and the last several years, even it, like it, tabletop RPGs blew up during COVID and lockdowns. Like it's been very much growing in the last several years, doubling in the next five as a prediction, as a as a forecast. Even like it's not even a prediction. They're like saying this is what we expect to happen. Yeah. If you if you have an idea for a tabletop RPG product of some kind, dice accessories books, digital assets, uh, virtual tabletop, anything. Uh, you probably should get in it now because market experts are saying there's going to be a massive influx of money coming into this market. And I mean, as as it's also at this time, we've seen uh, you know, a little bit to the side, things like creators, especially on TikTok uh, and other social medias have been coming out and saying like, hey, certain platforms like t- Twitch and Etsy are really screwing over their creators. So uh, we're all looking to make new platforms or like mm-hmm. go to YouTube instead. So this is, you know, based on, on this market watch, if it's going to continue to grow and if other platforms that uh, support these sort of things, again, if you're a creator of physical objects, not going on Etsy, if you're a creator of digital content, not going on Twitch, this is a good time to jump in, like you're saying. Yeah, the the drive through RPG, uh, Dungeon Masters Guild, it's very easy to sell on Amazon now. Mm-hmm. Amazon has very, very generous rates for sellers. Very generous. You could also uh, invite people into your basement and yeah. lock them up there. Discord servers, uh, make content, you know. Lock them in the attic. That's fine too. Uh, some other interesting statistics. Uh, we don't. Ha- we don't really have to linger on this. I think this is just sort of interesting and fun things to know if you're into tabletop RPGs. Uh, the United States only makes up thirty-eight point three seven percent of the total TTRPG market. I would have predicted more than half hmm. if you were just to ask me. So this is kind of surprising, but it is global. Um, they a lot of their research was conducted uh, internationally. Oh, where is that? Where's the reference? Hold on. Hold on. I can find it, I promise. Okay, maybe I can't. Okay. It is... It is... This research has been conducted across North America, Europe, South America, the Middle East, Africa, and Asia Pacific. This is everywhere except Antarctica. 
Which we know that all the researchers there are probably playing GTRPGs in their office. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But it is, it, they literally have, have done this market research globally. So it is not just American markets. And clearly, it's less than 40%, which is still massive. It's, yeah, it's a lot. It's still massive. Probably it, a plurality still. It, absolutely, I would argue it probably is still the largest percentage for any single nation. Mm-hmm. Uh, they listed off the largest manufacturers in the tabletop role-playing game market worldwide. And there might be some interesting or unknown names on this. Uh, Frog God Games, Troll Lord Games, Freya Legan, uh, Necrotic Gnome, Son of Oak Game Studios, Goodman Games, Pinnacle Entertainment, Cubicle 7, uh, Sign No Mine, so, Sign No Mean, Sign No Mine, I don't yeah. know. Palladium Books, we've heard of them. Uh, Evil Hat Productions, Chaosium, we've heard of. Uh, Modifius, of course, Wizards of the Coast, Paizo. Edge Studios, Renegade Game Studios, R, Talsorian, and Magpie Games. Specifically, the top six are what you would expect. Wizards of the Coast, Paizo, Magpie, Chaosium, Bully Pit, and Pinnacle Entertainment. Um, if you're interested in this sort of thing, uh, fucking shell out the big bucks, because it is an expensive report. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> that being said, it is... It is nice to see that market professionals that that study economic market, like that's what they do. Mm-hmm. They look at economic markets and they study them and they can make predictions and they're often fairly accurate. Predicting this much of a massive growth in the tabletop RPG uh, market, I think is going to bode well. Yeah. Um, you mo- a lot of people don't like capitalism right now. I think that's a little silly personally, but... And you can agree or disagree with trickle-down economics, but the more money that comes into the market, you're going to get more products, you're going to get better products. That's kind of how it works at the end of the day. It's also things like this uh, that I think for a long time we didn't see that. I don't think any, you know, I can't imagine that in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and aughts, people were doing market reports on TTRPGs. Um, so now that we're getting, you know, market reports and seeing that there's huge growth potential, Mm -hmm. um, I think that really brings it in as a legitimate concept, Mm -hmm. a legitimate opportunity, a legitimate business, business. a legitimate businessman. What's that card called? Legitimate businessman. Oh no, it create, it turns someone into into a legit. Oh, there's an MTG card from... Uh, is it Witness Protection? It is Witness Protection. It's from... Not Kamigawa. New Capenna. New Capenna. From New Capenna. And it, it's an enchantment that turns someone into a zero one one with no abilities called a legitimate businessman. Legitimate businessman. <laughs> That's also a reference to the Whiskey Tribe. But it's, 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 it is encouraging to see that this is going to be a space that is growing. And... Uh, here at Dungeon Bros, we will be po- poised and ready to take advantage of such market opportunities. By not wearing sleeves. By, yeah. <laughs> sleeves are bullshit. We're both wearing tank tops, right? His, actually, you're wearing a cutoff. I'm wearing a tank top. Yes. So, for those not watching the live. <laughs> Do you have anything else to say? Uh, no, well, you know what? I'll, I'll segue. I'll segue. Oh, you want to segue? Yeah. All this talk of market values made me hungry. What can D&D help me with there? <laughs> Into the wrap-up now. We that, was a, that, was a, that was a bad segue. <laughs> no, it was great. It was great. Everybody everybody, tell Connor that I have great segues. Wrap-up. There's a new D&D cookbook. Dungeons & Dragons Heroes Feast Flavors of the Multiverse. There's been a cover reveal for this book. It has over 70 recipes inspired by the Dungeons & Dragons Multiverse. Uh, comicbook.com also got a look at some of the the recipes therein. Uh, we see the thrackle seared beef in red sauce, the Serlunian glow fire, whatever the fuck that is. I Elverquist. The- I don't. I don't know what. I don't. Uh, those appear to be cocktails. Oh well, yeah, that checks out. No, it seems like there is no release date yet for the flavors of the multiverse, but uh, it is written by Kyle Newman, John Peterson, Michael Whitmer, Whitwer, and Sam Whitwer. Um, if you were a fan of the original Heroes Feast uh, from Dungeons and Dragons many years ago, about well, it had, that was also an official cookbook. Uh, oh, it is going to be released in November by Penguin Random House. So if you're into if you're into cooking and you're into D and D and into cooking D and D things, check it out in November. 
I will say the old the old cookbook. A friend of mine has it, and I've looked at it, and uh, it's not impressive. It's not an interesting cookbook. But so far, the few pages they've showed here look a lot better. I believe uh, look, that. Uh, and there is an author's note down at the bottom of this that says a few of the recipes from Flavors of Multi- Multiverse will be featured in the upcoming Heroes Feast cooking show produced by E1 for those hungry for a sneak peek at what's in on offer in the new book. Mm-hmm. Next up, Critical Role did a one shot in cooperation with Nintendo to promote the Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, the new Switch game for The Legend of Zelda, and they created a custom Zelda tabletop RPG, and uh, we might never see it. Uh, recently, Critical Role played Legend of a Legend of Zelda-inspired tabletop role-playing game, and uh, we might never hear about it again. At this point, there is no Nintendo-approved... There's not a Nintendo-approved uh, Zelda-inspired tabletop RPG in existence, but or at least for sale. But it does exist, and it's totally playable, and uh, Critical Role and Nintendo are just kind of remaining silent about it. Uh, What we do know about this system, uh, Critical Role and Nintendo Treehouse collaborated to create the custom Legend of Zelda TTRPG that is based on the events and lore of Tears of the Kingdom. Uh, Nintendo sponsored the Critical Role stream, and it makes this a a fairly official TTRPG, at least in the eyes of Nintendo. It uses both a D20 turn-based combat mechanic system, which includes initiative and hit point-based damage. It seems to be a slimmed-down Dungeons & Dragons combat, uh, similar in the the vein of Knave or Into the Odd, very old-school role-playing game structures. Uh, It also takes inspiration from Apocalypse World by Vincent and Maggie Baker uh, in game design parlance, and the game... A game that does this is so-called, quote, powered by the apocalypse. They tend to use a 2d6 dice system. So it's kind of this weird mashup of things. Uh, D&D powered by the apocalypse. And it's fully playable. You can can see, I believe the one shot is live right now that you can find on YouTube for the replay on uh, on Critical Role's YouTube. And... uh, are you are you into Zelda? I've never actually played a Zelda game. Hmm. None of them. No, none of them. I played almost all of Ocarina of Time. And Link's crossbow training on the Wii. <laughs> sure, that's kind of it. Oh, I did play a lot of uh, Link to the Past on the SNES as a small, as a small one, as a little one. I did not get very far in that because I was a little one. You were a little one, yeah, very little one, but. The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom is widely regarded as uh, very, very, very good by people that like The Legend of Zelda. Uh, Matt Mercer, of course, voices Ganondorf in The Tears of the Kingdom. So if you're into Zelda and you're into TTRPGs, uh, write your local uh, Nintendo representative. Because there is a TTRPG that exists. And they've played it. But it doesn't really exist. Which is a shame. Lastly, Dimension 20 has announced the new season of its Dungeons & Dragons actual play show, this time featuring a group of celebrity drag queens. The stars of Dungeons & Drag Queens will appear on RuPaul's Drag Race Alaska. All appeared. All appeared on RuPaul's Drag Race Alaska, Bob the Drag Queen, Jujubee, and Monette X Change. Uh, Brandon Lee Mulligan himself also puts on a lot of makeup and jewels and looks. Fabulous. Fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. You can see the trailer right now on YouTube. Just search up Dungeons and Drag Queens. If you are into that sort of thing, it's going to be available on the College Humor paid content site, Dropout TV. And I'm sure you're going to see many, many, many clips of this all over the internet. And in Pride Month, too. Yeah. It seems like they did that on purpose. Wow. I mean, it's only available at the end of Pride Month, but still. <sighs> Starting June 28th. It's fine. They're promoting it now. Uh, if you are curious, uh, the drag queens introduced their characters, a merfolk assassin, a hulking orc barbarian, a tiefling sorceress, and a ranger fae. Character art is also available. Um, yeah. If you're a fan of Dimension 20, uh, this is basically an all-new cast except for Brennan. So that's always exciting. Yeah. The Dimension 20 does a good job of rotating out uh, casts for different mini series that they do, mm-hmm. considering they don't really have an actual long running series. Yeah. They have a couple that have two seasons, but that's about it. Yeah. One thing I will say uh, drag queens, 
were totally marketed toward people like us, right? He said sarcastically. I get the appeal. Sure. I get why people like it. It's fun. I've been to a drag show. Yeah. I too. It was fun. It's fine. It's fine. Not really my thing. But we're also, you know, straight white men. We're not really oh, the I target didn't, market. I didn't like it because there was crowds. Oh, oh. I didn't like it because I didn't know what to do. Also fair. It didn't it didn't like make me uncomfy? I was just like I was just like, how? I, what's the appropriate reaction to all of these things that are happening? I don't know. I feel like, like I just have never been. I feel like it would be a similar if I went if you know if we went to like a, a burlesque show. Yeah, kind of that same. Yeah. Like a regular, uh, you know, yeah. historically regular burlesque show. Yeah, I mean it's if you're into that if you're into drag if you're into drag shows more power to you. It's great. I'm probably not going to be going to too many unless unless uh, there's someone I'm trying to date that wants to go to one really badly. And then it's like, you also, know what? We'll, I'll do that. Also, the main place that does them in, in Cincinnati, uh, which is a bar, is kind of not a great bar. Yeah. It's not, it's, it's not It's not because of the drag. No, it's, it's not because of, it's because the clientele are assholes. Yeah. And the management does not run that place very safely. well. At, oh, yeah. Not safely. There's a much better bar right down the road yes, called Queen City absolutely. Radio. And yep. they're a much better place and much more um, actually LGBTQ friendly and, and safe. And <laughs> safe. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, with all that being said, that's really all the news we have. Nothing too major. We could have rambled on for probably a half hour talking about all of the Lord of the Rings cards we cracked. We cracked them all live on our weekly Monday Night Magic, 9 p.m. Eastern Time, live on TikTok. We play Magic the Gathering, and when a set comes out and we got a lot of stuff to open, we open cards. Uh, I also did an impromptu one the Friday before mm-hmm. where I opened a lot of cards because I am a psychopath, and I have uh, bad bad self-control with spending money on Lord of the Rings things. So I opened a lot of cards, and that was really, really fun. I believe statistically the most successful live the Dungeon Bros has ever put on. Yeah, the very first I night, think so. The very first night of pre-release. We had over 20,000 views total with concurrence in the 800 to 1,000 range, like the entire hour and a half I was opening packs. So it was really, really fun. Uh, Sam was busy exercising. Driving. I wasn't exercising yet. That is true. I was on the way to Michigan to get ready to exercise. Yes. A uh, Tough Mudder? Tough Mudder. Yes. Okay, you did a Spartan thing earlier. Two weeks. Uh, not this... Yeah, the weekend before. Yeah. Yeah, you're a fucking psychopath. That being said, you should join us there. You can find the podcast on podcast services around the globe, but we need to get to the end of the podcast, and for that, we take questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas from both the Discord server and the TikTok live chat because we do stream this every week on TikTok. Uh, this wasn't put into the podcast questions channel, but uh, this person was really cool in our live last night and they did ask a question on our Discord server. Uh, this is Rick to Fire. I'm new to Magic and I've been playing on Magic the Gathering Arenas and I bought a few deck bundles and some packs. They want to expand their collection and they asked if the bulk boxes you can buy on Amazon are good to buy. I'm unfamiliar with these boxes, generally speaking. But if you're buying Magic the Gathering cards in bulk, this is what I replied to them in the Discord server, which, by the way, you can join the Discord server, link in the link tree in the bio. It might work. Actually, it's not a, it's not a link tree anymore. It's a beacons. 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 Beacons link in the bio, uh, which, by the way, is a much better link tree option, than a link in bio option than link tree. Not sponsored, but, you know, it's just better. Um, if you're looking to buy a lot of cards for Magic the Gathering, Buying bulk on eBay, Amazon from just like a faceless seller, probably not the best plan. Uh, They're going to be selling you a lot. You're going to be able to get like a thousand cards probably for not a lot of money. Mm -hmm. It's probably going to be a lot of basic lands. It's probably going to be a lot of useless tokens. It's probably going to be a lot of commons that are worth like two cents that are really not playable. Yeah. Uh, If you want to get into paper magic, the best thing to do is to buy pre-constructed decks uh, from Wizards of the Coast. You can get affordable ones. The starter decks, Mm -hmm. for example. There's a starter deck like every year. A lot of sets have starter decks as well available with them. The Lord of the Rings set has a starter deck. It is uh, two decks, actually, because you need two people to play the game. And the two-pack was like 12 bucks. And you get two full, complete, ready-to-play Magic the Gathering decks. They're 60-card decks. 
Uh, it's basically standard. <laughs> they don't run a, a lot of multiple copies of things just to kind of keep the card pool diverse and let you experiment and do all that kind of stuff. Uh, there's Pioneer pre-constructed decks. There's Modern... Pre- is there Modern pre-constructed decks? Uh, I don't know if there is. There's definitely, of course, Commander pre-cons. Yeah, oh, yes. The big, the big ones, there's, oh my god, probably over 20 that have been put out uh, in the past 12 months year. yeah uh the lord of the rings pre-cons are really good uh most all of the pre-con if, if if you're buying a pre-con for a commander deck get one that was released in a set of four those tend to be a little bit better if you're if they're releasing two commander decks they're not usually as nice yeah there's usually one big release a year where there's like a good like it's a good like well-designed good value decks but buying pre-constructed decks, you know exactly what cards you're getting, you know the value of them, and it's the best deal. And if you want to upgrade, buy singles to upgrade those pre-constructed decks. Mm-hmm. That is the official opinion of the Dungeon Bros. Also, if you're looking to buy bulk cards, uh, don't do it through Amazon or eBay. Do it on like a Facebook Marketplace or like a garage sale or like a flea market. Or your local game store. Games Or your local game store. They might... They might... They might... They might hook you up. You never know. But Sam, questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas from the TikTok live chat. What do you got for us? Uh, a little bit of a uh, little bit of MTG LOTR talk. Loter. Loter. Um, really is a good set. Uh, KD asks, "Who's our favorite commander?" Generally, or from the Lord of the Rings cards? Don't know. Just says favorite commander? Question mark. Oh man. Um, Let's go with uh, let's just go with uh, the Magic the Gathering Lord of the Rings since that's what we're we're okay. on. Okay, I will say of the decks that I have created, my favorite is probably <sighs> honestly, it's Tovalar. Tovalar, the were- Werewolf Tribal. Werewolf Tribal works. I I recently did some upgrades to Tovalar that Tovalar is now a dual purpose deck. I have I have marked the front face of some of the cards on penny sleeves, mm-hmm. and uh, I can pull them out and have an Oathbreaker deck and a Commander deck at the same time, which is pretty cool. It's a fun thing. I should make a video about that. It's you pretty should. cool. I saw the, I saw a post on Twitter about it, and I was like, "That's a great idea." Basically, just take take your Commander and take a Planeswalker that works, and then you just it, that like work in the same strategy, and then you just bless you. Shut up. Uh, and then you make your commander deck, and then you pick the cards that you need for your Oathbreaker deck. Or make your Oathbreaker deck, and then fill in cards for your commander deck. Highly recommend. Uh, for Lord of the Rings, my favorite commander. It's got to be Aragorn the Uniter. Mm. Multicolor spells matter. Not the not the Nazgul? The Lord of the Nazgul I'm excited for, for Wraith Tribal, and the Nazgul cards are really, really good. And I love, I love a little bit of, I want to get a Demir deck, uh, that's blue-black in Magic the Gathering terms, and I love, I love a spell slinger where you're casting spells and then your creatures give you value for casting the spells, which is why I like Aragorn the Uniter even more, because you get access to four of the five colors, everything but black, and uh, it encourages you to be casting multicolor spells, mm-hmm. which is where you get a lot of cool modal effects, where you can choose what a card does, uh, where you can get a lot of more powerful effects because they tend to cost a little bit more mana, but you're getting even more value for casting them uh, with Aragorn the Uniter. That is the one I'm most excited for. Gotcha. See, I think that one would slot nicely into an Omnath Locust of All deck mm-hmm. because Omnath also uh, wants you to have uh, multicolored pips yep. or uh, multiple pips in a in a card's casting cost. Which, by the way, there are the there are the magic cards where it's like you can pay this pip with either red or green mm-hmm. or white or blue. If it is, if that's one. That's two colors in one pip. So you can cast a three color spell for two mana. Or four color spell for three, or Whatever. depending on what the the pips are. Yeah, which is fun. Uh, my favorite commander from Lord of the Rings: Magic the Gathering uh, is going to be, I think, uh, Shelob. Yeah, the child of Unglent. Yeah, uh, Spider Tribal. Ugh. She herself is uh, she's a uh, green black and four, I believe, for a six six with Ward two and Death Touch, and gives all other spiders you control Ward two and Death Touch. And whenever a spider you control kills a thing, you get to create a food token of that thing. Yeah. So you take out, what is this? Elish Norn, Mommy of Mommies. You get a food token that uh, gives you double all of the abilities. Yeah, double ETBs and uh, kills your opponent's ETBs. 
I, I, I do think the decks that their strategy is dictated by what the opponents, like the other decks you're playing against are, like the value you get out of Shelob and the spiders and killing creatures depends on the creatures you're, of your opponents that you are killing and what their strategies are. True. Will play into that. And the fact that they're artifacts... They're not creatures, so they can't be killed in combat. Yeah. And they have to use artifact-based removal to remove them from the game. And if they choose to do that for a token, mind you, you can simply pay two and tap it and you gain three life. Yeah. Instead. Yeah. It, it's it, it's devilish. It's super cool. It is, uh-huh. very, it is very cool. I think that is going to be a very powerful deck when it's all laid out properly. Spiders mm-hmm. can be a bit expensive to ca- to cast. Yeah, it's either like you got you got your low drop spiders that are going to be 1-3 with reach. Like yeah. there's a lot of yeah. those out there. Or it's like, yeah, a 6 drop spider that does one like cool thing. Mm-hmm. But I've gone through, I've gotten, I found some some cool ones. I found some ones that I already have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm looking for, and I pulled it last night. Yeah, Shelob. We I, both did. We both have yeah, Shelob. We both have a Shelob. So I don't have the other Shelob, which I would like, which is yeah, is mono that black, black, mono black. Uh, when a creature your, your opponent controls dies, you exile it, and then you can use that exiled card to either draw cards or uh, put, put yeah draw cards and put plus one counters on that Shelob, or bring it under your control on the battlefield. That's fucky, right? It's awesome, especially if you. If you kill that creature, you can get the food token copy, and then that other Shelob can exile. So you can have two copies of a creature on yeah. basically, and they're not going to be legend ruled because one of them's not a creature. One's just a food token and yeah. loses all other types. That's fucked. <laughs> that is very fucked. SK goes two four. Do you ever answer questions? Or only look at them. Well, we answer them at the end of the podcast. Yes. Uh, if you read the sign, it's. Ask us questions for us to answer at the end. And we are now at the end of the podcast, and we are now answering the questions. Keenan Perry. As, Did, as is the case with Magic... The, sorry, Keenan. <laughs> as is the case with Magic the Gathering, reading the card explains the card. Reading the sign explains what we're doing. Uh, Keenan. That's a name I recognize. Keenan Perry often uh, jumps in here. Mm-hmm. Uh, does YouTube Music have open license tracks? I'd love to stream d and so. I'd love that for streaming D&D. If there is a YouTube video... That a lot that is, um, I, I think the default YouTube license that you do that that is like automatically applied when you upload a video allows it to be put on YouTube Music in most cases. Uh, so you, there's you can get all, there's a whole bunch of creators that do like cool mashups and like and their own custom songs that are really small and don't really have distribution. You can get those on YouTube Music. Yeah, uh, the official Druid asks thoughts on group hug decks. I would I mean, love to build a group hug deck. We were we were talking about this before we went live with, because the group hug the uh, the Faramir uh, Prince of Gondor mm-hmm. card, yeah. um, it getting you get value and then an, from another player making a decision. If they don't attack you, you get to draw a card. If they do attack you, you get three one one soldier tokens. And I think Azorius has a lot of really fun cards mm-hmm. in that style of. You get value if you make a deal with an opponent and then you work together in some way, which I think really can help enable fun play in Commander games. Oh, for sure. Flump is one of my favorite examples of that. Yeah. It's a 1-4 with Defender. It might be a 0-4 with Defender, but if it, when uh, it when it blocks a creature, both you and that and the attacking player get to draw a card. So it's like, hey, you got that 1-1 one, one over here. You want to attack my, my me? I'll block my Flump. We both get a card. Yep. Howling Mind's a great uh, another one. Uh, Lorne of the Third Path. Tapping into, and you mm-hmm. and another player draw a card. Uh, Silvala mm-hmm. with her parlay ability. Yep. There's a lot of there's a lot of fun group hug. I think that I think having one of those players at a commander game is going to make it more enjoyable for everybody. Oh yeah. Um, that being said. The group hug, the group hug player may not seem like a threat, but they're the ones that are going to end up getting the most value because they can spread the love to everybody, but they're always getting value every time it happens. Yeah. So just, you know, be careful. If it's uh, down to you and the group hug player, you might be fucked. You might be <laughs> KD, uh, what cards are you most excited for in the set other than the one of one of one ring, obviously? The one of one one ring uh, available in in Pokemon Scarlet and Violet Paldea uh, evolved. Yes, expansion cards. Um, most excited for I'm not 
not really excited for them anymore because we opened so many. We did, yeah. I was previously most excited for uh, Aragorn the Uniter, Tom Bombadil, uh, uh, the Lord of Nazgul, the Nazgul cards themselves. Um, and then, of course, like the super powerful cards that are going to be staples in many formats, the Orcish Bowmasters, mm-hmm. Stern Scolding. Uh, right now, uh, the... Oh, it's not Great Havens. It's the 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 Great Hall of the Citadel mm-hmm. land. Yeah, and Lembus Bread are tearing it up in Popper right now, which is very exciting because those are cards that can go in any Popper deck. Oh yeah, and those I think are very quickly going to become like Popper EDH mm-hmm. uh, staples. Which, by the way, we play Popper EDH. We each have a deck. I need to make another one. I, I want to make another. I'm one. in the process of making another one. Yeah. Uh, I'm also excited for. Oh, I just had it and I lost. Oh. Um, this this particular set has a lot of scry mm-hmm. synergies. Synergy uh, like when you scry, put plus one counters on this thing. When you scry, uh, uh, you can reveal the top card, and if it's a land, you can put it onto the bow. Things like that, um, and that's actually you were looking at one of my piles, which is a bunch of cards that have scry mm-hmm. synergies on them. And I think and I love when they do that, and they put something in that's like. Like, okay, yeah, Scry is pretty good. It's worth half of a card draw most of the time. Um, but to have Scry synergies, that's not something we've hugely seen in the past. Mm-hmm. So that's exciting. Yeah, the, the Elvish Council precon deck is built largely around Scrying a lot. A lot of the Elf, card, elf cards have, have Scrying synergies. Uh, it also makes cards that people seem to be, seem to think are less playable, like uh, the tapped dual land, the tapped scry lands, mm-hmm. uh, those suddenly become much more valuable, and they're cheap. They are cheap. They are ta- they en- they're lands that enter tapped, and they can tap for two colors. But if they're ETBing and scrying, you get a scry trigger off your landfall, which can then do a lot of other triggers on your board, mm-hmm. which might offset the penalty a lot for you of uh, not having of not having that land immediately accessible to tap for mana. Will we ever see it in CD, uh, CDH? No. Probably not. No, no. absolutely not. Um, let's see. Moving on. Magic. Or- Orcish Bowmasters on the other Orcish hand. Orcish Stern Scolding. We'll probably see those in some CDH decks. Magic the Gatherer says, uh, asks, are we getting? Are we going to try for all 30 box toppers? They are, but they're afraid of the price. The box toppers, I might have to make an exception for. <laughs> because uh, it would be it would be cheaper to buy them as singles. Yeah. It will be cheaper to buy them as singles. It's not necessarily the goal of this exercise, though. <laughs> that being said, uh, they're not cheap singles. They're not like $3 singles. They're like $15, $20, $25, $50 dollar singles. Yeah. Which, I mean, at a certain point, might as well just buy another set booster box. Is that a good investment? No. No, it is not a good investment. Don't be like me. Be smarter. Uh... Brandon Vol, what's up, guys? What's up, Brandon? Hey, the Brandon Vol, moderator of the Dungeon Bros Live on TikTok, also a subscriber of the Dungeon Bros. If you subscribe to us on TikTok, uh, you get special emojis for all of our live streams and a special Discord role. And you're more likely for us to like see. You. Well, you can. D- I think. I think I let you DM us. I think I've let people that subscribe to us DM us. I don't remember. That being said, we love our subscribers, and you guys are amazing. We also love all the people that have gifted us and joined the team on TikTok. I don't know what the... I still don't fully get what the TikTok teams thing is. Yeah, I don't either. But I'm into it. It's fun. It's neat. It's silly. I'm into fun, silly, goofy things. Ryan Michael, is that an Assassin's Creed Gears of War tattoo? Indeed it is. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for noticing. Uh, Keenan Perry, wish they would just call it 5.5 since it's so similar. Talking about... Yes. Yeah. We do too. Like... Everyone says, don't just call it 5th edition, because it's not. They're like, no, we're just going to call it 5th edition, because we just revised 5th edition. Yeah, you revised 5th edition. It's not 5th edition. That's the point. Five point like People are going to have to refer to it as 5.5, or the 2014 D- D&D 5th edition, or 1D&D. They're never, going to, they're never going to refer to it as 5th edition, because the rules are so different. The details are so different. Now, when it comes out, if all the one D&D changes are, like, rolled back and it's, like, only kind of modified, then I can see the point. But if they're going to, like, try and revise a lot, then 
just make it five five point five and revise it. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't think anybody would be upset by that. Seems uh, like they are though. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, user and a bunch of numbers. I want to play D and D, but have no reference for entry. Do people do online D and D or anything of the sort? Yes. Um, there are several websites you can find. I can't remember the 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 big one off the top of my head, but you can sign up to. Uh, pay a dungeon master to play D anD D, and the prices can range from like ten dollars for a session. And there's someone there, some that are like really, really good and really, really successful. They they pay like like they charge like forty dollars a seat to play in their D anD D game. That is an option if you don't have money or you don't want to spend money. Uh, you can find people on Reddit. You can find Discord communities. Our own, the Dungeon Bros Discord community, uh, has a lot of people in there that there is one there is one group that has been consistently playing D for a very long time there and there has been uh, occasional one shots and stuff that have been set up on the discord server uh but there's communities all over the internet to find that if you want to try in person you can always look up adventures league games that are happening uh or or just uh find find someone who admits to being a dm and uh, uh weasel your way into friendship uh manipulate them a little bit and make them uh allow you at their game table food and food and uh uh promises of uh of chill gameplay are a very good way to get them to allow you at your table you don't have to fall through on the promises but you can you know be like oh yeah no i'm just gonna be i'm just gonna be like a chill fighter and then suddenly you're like fucking i don't know doing crazy shit all right uh, uh, recognized name camouflage. Yes, says. Uh, I'm actually not sure what camouflage is saying. If someone told you <laughs> can get a case of one set on them, what case would it be? Camouflage, if you're still in chat, um, please clarify your question because I'm not sure what you're asking. A, boost, a booster box. If someone told you can get a case of one set on them, so they would be buying. What's if you could get a case of a set? Ah. On someone else's dollar, what set would that be? Hmm. Now, a case, colloquially, is like a cardboard box that has a ton of set booster boxes in them. I assume... I'm going to assume that it's just a single set booster... Wonderful. I'm going to assume it's a single set booster box. If I could get a, a single set booster of any of any set, what set would I get? Alpha. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you want to provide me the 360 alpha cards? All right. Uh, for those of you that don't know, if that if there even is a, a sealed set booster box of alpha, it's probably millions upon millions of dollars. Um, if you remember last year when they did the the when they did uh, Dominary United and then Dominary Remastered, one thing they happened to find was a warehouse full of re- of original Dominaria set booster boxes. And they had people uh, basically like coming in with, well, face masks because it was COVID, but also like gloves and opening them up and showing the camera. And I remember uh, there's a video where the professor of the Delarian Community College uh, gets a single pack, and because kept because the packs were like uber expensive, hundreds of dollars, hundreds of thousands. dollars. Yeah. And he opens it up, and the first card he gets is a tabernacle. Which is worth over a thousand dollars. Yeah. So I'd want a case of that. Uh, yeah, that's fine. I'm I'm cool with that. Uh, Charizard is a dragon. Says, can I even can I stay even if I'm not wearing a tank top? Charizard, rip your rip you your, have to rip the sleeves. You off. have to rip the sleeves off. Yeah. Um. You've got to go like full like '70s Incredible Hulk and just like Hulk out, but like kind of keep the shirt a little bit. Yeah. Oh my god. Oh <laughs> what? Tyson. Svensson uh, point we were talking about Shelob points out it does a weird thing when a planeswalker is turned into a creature dies because there are some planeswalkers and there are some enchantments that can also turn the planeswalker into a creature so if you kill that then it's a creature it triggers the effect so you then have a food of the planeswalker still having all its planeswalker loyalties but its abil- loyalty abilities but it's not a planeswalker, so if you drop it down to zero of loyalty, it doesn't die. It's also not a creature, so you can't target it. Or a planeswalker. It's not a planeswalker, so you can't target it. You, that's fucked up. <laughs> that's awesome. That's a fuck. That's a fucked up reality. 
And now I now I know that you just added another class of cards to your deck. The the turn a planeswalker into a creature cards. <sighs> Thankfully there's not too many and they're usually self equip they're usually like target something you control. I think. And there are there are several planeswalkers that turn themselves into creatures with indestructible though. Yeah. Is the thing. There is a red card. I mean there's a there's like Shadow Spear that gets rid of indestructible. Mm -hmm. There's uh there's a red card in this set that can also get rid of indestructible. Oh my god, that's right. Hold on. And let me pull out let me pull out I have one of these planeswalkers. It's the Oathbreaker planeswalker. Oh gosh, they, they it is so tight in this deck box. <laughs> so many double sided cards. Uh Arlen Cord. Oh no, she doesn't. It's the other Arlen. Never mind. Okay. She becomes a 5 5 wolf with indestructible. Gotcha. Has a zero ability on her nightbound side. Anywho, carry on. Um. Ooh, um. Lachlan got the number one gifter badge. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and asks So, opinion, I make dice and I'm working on a collection of. Uh, collection. What kind of colors should I put out? Uh, Look at the color wheel. <laughs> choose your favorite. <laughs> choose choose the the ten that are on that. <laughs> so we actually we did uh, we have a friend who up in Michigan, Jason of uh, Found Familiar Dice, mm -hmm. a very successful dice uh, dice auteur maker, I think crafter of dice tier. Crafter of DC, um, and we actually asked him about that uh, how he chooses like colors because he sent us some dice and they're very pretty, very pretty dice. And basically, he was just he said his uh, his motivations and his uh, influences were what colors he has available at the time and like rocks and what he wants to make. Yeah, <laughs> uh, if you another oh, don't get into this because it is stupidly expensive. But if you're into geology and uh, like the crystals and all of that kind of shit, uh, Hedron Rockworks they make dice out of. Uh, out of press out of precious materials like amethyst and they grind like they have videos of them grinding down the rock faces to create these beautiful glass like gem literal gemstone dice not not resin dice that look like gemstones because they're so clear and perfectly polished but literal actual gemstone mm -hmm. dice they're stupid expensive but they are so pretty um Alex Richard Boggs, what was your favorite D and D character that you played? Character that I've played. Oh man, I haven't played. I haven't played too many characters, honestly. Um, probably, probably my wizard Lucian. Mm. The best, the most well-rounded suite of abilities, and uh, so tragic, so tragic in the backstory. Mine was probably. Uh... My wizard it was a necromancer. Yeah. Not because fun? not because the necromancer not just because the school of necromancy in D and D five E is fun. It's not really. But I made my own stuff that I didn't get to implement because we ended that game. Um, is it ended? Ended? I'm pretty sure it's done forever. Yeah, fair. I, I think they've. I think all, all parties have moved on. But uh, necromancers are fun and cool. And if you want a better one, check out our drive through RPG where I made a better one and it's for free and available. Yeah, you can get it for for free. All right, last question here. It's a it's a it's a question that I do know the answer to. It's a Magic the Gathering technical question. Can you uh, from Kosh? Uh, Koshaban. Koshaban. Can you capsize or any other return to owner? Uh, return to owner's hand effect an emblem uh you cannot nope. emblem there is no way to interact with an emblem once it is uh on once it is on a player yep it is technically outside of the battlefield yeah it is not targetable yes uh it is not an L like when it says uh target spell it's not a spell it's not a permanent nope it is out. It is just there. It is there forever. That's what makes the the tempted by the ring mechanic so interesting and powerful. Mm, it's also an it, emblem. You cannot remove it, which could be beneficial. It also there are some drawbacks. So it might because for one, for example, the second level of the of the tempted by the ring is uh, when you deal combat damage, you draw a card, you discard a card. Mm -hmm. You have to do that. It is not a may ability. So, I mean, it's almost always a good thing. But right. Card selection. Card selection. But, you know, certain points in the game, depending on what strategies are being used, it might not work out too well. True. If somebody's already milled you way down. Yeah. 
or and of course if you're at that point and the person who's milling you is probably already ready to mill you out the rest of the way or if you have a card like a card that you really really need and you don't realize you really really need it until other people have been doing stuff at instant speed during your combat step true then damage goes through you have to get rid of that card to draw a card niche examples but niche examples very niche with all that being said, Samuel, we're at the end of the podcast. We are uh, uh, kind of a ch- kind of a brief one. I don't know if it was chill. We we talked about we we got some, we got into some heavy shit with the market and the and the new TSR nonsense. Yeah, but it was a good time. We like we love the Dungeon Bros podcast. We do it every other week on Wednesdays. Uh, you can get it on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify. Uh, uh, I believe it's on Alexa. It's on YouTube Music now. Mm-hmm. Um, if you listen to the highway traffic mm-hmm. uh, from about a mile away, you yep. can hear the Dungeon Bros podcast. Yeah, on if you if you are on a police scanner, if you have one of those in your vehicle and you put it on scan, uh, if you end up going to make out point and you kind of point the antennas toward uh, the setting sun, mm-hmm. you can often get a direct feed of the Dungeon Bros podcast. Uh, only at make out point though. Yeah. Only at make out point. Um, yeah. Murder point doesn't work. No. Murder point doesn't work. Uh, middle of the forest. Any random hill. No. Not happening. Not happening. Incidentally, it also happens at Mount Rushmore. Yeah. That one's a weird one. Yeah. We can't figure that one out. Yeah. I mean, Ra- Mount Rushmore's got a lot of weird stuff going on. I mean, like, the mountains formed in the faces of four presidents. Like, that's crazy. Yeah. Can't they believe just, that four people grew up to look like that. I know. They just, they, they were formed exactly like that. And it's just... And that that one, they all had one body. Yeah. The mountain. The mountain. Yeah. <laughs> the rest of the mountain. Yeah. And they all had different presidencies <laughs> as one body, but different heads. Anyway. Yeah. With all that being said, this has been a wonderful, wonderful podcast. Uh, you can check out our link in bio, follow us on TikTok, subscribe to us on the YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, all that kind of stuff. Darth RPG, Discord. We got all the stuff. We have an Amazon store. It's a whole fucking thing. We got so much shit. Yeah. Check out all the links in the bios. They have everything there. Uh, we'll be at Gen Con at the beginning of August. You can come see us there. We would absolutely love that. Say hi if you see us. Yes, and we love you very much. And in the meantime, peace 